Now, we talk about the ABCs of resuscitation when we talk about urban medicine, but when we move to the wilderness and we talk about wilderness medicine, it's important to expand the ABCs to three A's, three B's, and three C's. So I call them the three ABCs of wilderness medicine. So in your emergency department, you don't usually have to assess the scene to make sure it's safe, right? I mean, pretty well, you're, you're, you're okay, but if there is somebody you're, rec you're rescuing who's been in an avalanche, you want to make sure that it's safe to approach that victim before you start dealing with airway and alerting others. I mean, if somebody was mauled by a bear, you'd want to make sure the bear's not still in the vicinity, right? I think that's true. You know, bears get a lot of bad publicity, and uh, we worry about getting mauled by bears. We worry about bears all the time. I mean, here's a good example. This bear has the audacity and the nerve to actually take this poor guy's fish right off his line. Look at him. He's, like, not happy about that. But the bear is only doing that because he had a similar experience. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. At the river mouth, the bears catch only the tastiest, most tender salmon. Which is exactly what we at John West want. <laughs> John West endure the worst to bring you the best. That's the same bear right there. He's getting even. That's all I got to say about that. Okay. Now, what about the A, the airway? How can you improvise an airway for Pete's sake? The reason we do all these maneuvers when we're doing the ABCs we can hyperextend the neck or do the jaw thrust or the chin lift as we're trying to bring the tongue forward. When somebody is unconscious or semi-conscious, there's relaxation of the tongue and it falls back and occludes the airway. So we don't like to hyperextend necks of trauma patients because of the potential for cervical spine injury. So we do the jaw thrust where you kind of move that jaw forward, but all we're really doing is bringing the tongue forward. Well, how can you improvise an airway with just duct tape and safety pins? Very simple. All you have to do is safety pin the tongue to the lip. It works. I've tried it on many cadavers. It works a whole lot better if you safety pin it to the lower lip than the upper lip. And I heard that over there. She says, you know, you're really barbaric. And it, this is not as bad as it looks. If somebody has an airway block because their tongue is falling back, they're unconscious, unresponsive, they're not going to mind a couple safety pins through their tongue. Really. And if they should wake up while you happen to be sticking a safety pin through their tongue, very simple. Just remove it quickly. Tell them they had a seizure. Bit their tongue. They'll never know the difference. Shove those safety pins right back in your pocket. You're good to go. So we got some B's, the three B's, right? So before you do breathing, you want to make sure you put a barrier between your mouth and the victim's mouth. Nowadays, we don't even you know, do mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. We just sort of step on their chest every half second, and that seems to be good enough. But every once in a while, you do want to do some mouth-to-mouth -mouth rescue breathing. But look at this guy. This is in San Francisco. He's looking at this guy. He sees drool coming out of his mouth. He's vomiting. He's having second thoughts. And, and you know, he's, he's worried. This is an urban environment, let's say, and he's thinking about, you know what he's thinking about? He's not thinking about HIV, hepatitis, C, and all the bad things. He read in the same journal where I get all my medical literature about this new virus, and he <laughs> doesn't want to put his mouth on that victim's mouth. And you know, there's a take-home message here, and never put your mouth directly on what it is you're blowing into without some kind of a, a barrier device. And that's what this guy learned the hard way. So how do you improvise a breathing device? Well, you're probably not going to have that. This is the lung motor. This was developed by Howard Donner. He took a bicycle pump, some distributor uh, radiator hoses. He tells me what's nice about this. Not only does this push the air in, you could actually suck it back out. <laughs> Ski patrolmen here use this breathing device with a one-way Heimlich valve. 
but you don't need any of this because you have the ability to improvise. All you need is something that is uh, protective, like a latex or nitrile glove, for instance. You can take a glove and you can make a little slit in the long finger of the glove with your Swiss Army knife and just take that, shove it down the victim's mouth, and since it's latex or nitrile, it's a virus barrier, put it over the victim's mouth and you blow in. When you blow in, air goes through that hole and ventilates the patient. To allow the patient to exhale, just remove the nasal part and the victim can exhale and then put it back again. And you've got a nice CPR, CPR barrier. If there should be any back pressure like vomit, this little slit will collapse and you're good to go. Now this guy has another problem, which is airway related. He's got a piece of rebar going up through his neck into his mouth and it ends in his right maxillary sinus. So it's going to be tough to ventilate him. So what is this emergency doctor here feeling for with his left hand? He is feeling for the cricothyroid membrane. Now I told you the other day that the number one killer in the back country is trauma and the number two killer is anaphylactic shock from usually uh, bee stings or hymenoptera and venomation. If there's one thing that you should learn, and you don't have to be a surgeon, an emergency physician to do this, it's how to do a cricothyroidotomy because it really can save a life. And it is quite simple. This is all the stuff we use in the emergency department, absolutely unnecessary, you can improvise. To do a cricothyroidotomy is not rocket science. Um, people with a modicum of training can do this. All you have to do is find the location, which is easy. Just find your Adam's apple, which is your thyroid cartilage. And if you feel the front of your neck, it's the largest bump in your neck. And some people have a more prominent one than others. And then just slide your finger south towards your toes, and you come to a very tiny indentation. And you can feel it. You can kind of push your finger into it. And it feels very, very small, like a little slit. And you're thinking, well, it can't be it. It's too small. That is it, but it's quite stretchy. So that's the cricothyroid membrane, that's your target. Now take your knife and just make a vertical incision right over it, okay? You may get a little bit of bleeding, no problem. You can deal with that. Then you need something to put through that cricothyroid membrane. And here's what I recommend. You have a couple of uh, possibilities. This is a, a syringe. You can just take a syringe, like a 3cc or tuberculin syringe. You can remove the plunger. Cut the syringe at a 45 degree angle. Look at this puppy. This is beautiful. It even has this phalange right here so it doesn't get you know, sucked down into the membrane. And then what you can do is push it through a piece of duct tape and just push it right in through the cricothyroid membrane and you can ventilate someone or allow them to breathe on their own if they have an obstructed airway. Here's another thing you can use. You all recognize this. This is IV tubing that we use all the time in hospitals. EMS providers use it. There's a spike that goes into the bag. You can see the drip chamber right here in the tubing. Just take your knife and cut the drip chamber right in half. Now this is not micro drip, it's macro drip IV tubing. This is made to be a cricothyroid uh, device. You don't even have to make an incision through the skin. You can just find the cricothyroid membrane and that spike is so sharp it goes right in and then you can try and blow in it. If you can't blow in it, just come back because you may have gone through the, the, the trachea into the esophagus, but as you pull it back and as you blow, all of a sudden you'll get less resistance and you'll see the chest rise and that tells you that you're in the right place and then secure it with duct tape. Probably the neatest thing about this is it wasn't designed for this, but it just so happens that an ambu bag fits perfectly right over that drip chamber and you can use an ambu bag with this device. Here we are ventilating this piece of squash without any difficulty whatsoever. <laughs> and I have used this in the emergency department because we can never find these shyly catheters that you're supposed to use. And endotracheal tubes are way too long. And this is beautiful. It works great. Okay, anybody out there today getting sunburned on the top of their head, just take some strips of duct tape if you're uh, kind of losing your hair. And look at that, no burn on this side. Notice the redness right here. Now, how many people would have thought to use duct tape to improvise a hat, but it works. You could also use duct tape to improvise glasses. Did Howard tell you this? He told you about that? Okay, good. Well, he probably didn't tell you about this, did he? <laughs> yeah.